Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm pretty excited to be here at Berlin Buzzwords 2022, uh, here to talk about uh, what's new in Apache Solar. Uh, any new uh, major release for a project, for a project that's as big and as critical for people like Apache Solar is always a big thing. And with Apache Solar 9.0, there's a bit of, bit of history uh, that that is involved with this release in addition to just being a major release. So let me let me walk you through. Give me a minute, and I lost connection to the clicker. Uh, can I get the next slide? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'll start off with a little bit of history of how Solar evolved. Uh, Solar was started off as a project at CNET about in about two thousand four. Uh, it was donated to the ASF, and uh, it graduated to being an Apache top level project back in two thousand seven. Around 2010, uh, Lucene, Apache Lucene and Apache Solar. Uh, Lucene is what Solar was based on. Uh, the Solar community and Lucene community were pretty much uh, the same bunch of people. And they, they, they got together and realized that it made sense to merge both these projects. These projects ever since uh, stayed together and were released together. Um, and with, with almost kind of a release cadence starting uh, Solar 5 or 4.0, the release cadence was about a year, year and a half-ish. So every year, year and a half, there was a major version release. Until about uh, 2020, uh, when a conversation started in the community about separating these projects into their own independent uh, top-level projects at Apache. So basically establishing Solar as an independent project again. And uh, early 2021, we saw Solar being established as a separate Apache project. That makes uh, Solar 9.0 um, an important release in the sense that it's the first release of Apache Solar as an independent project that, that did not get released as part of the Apache Lucene project. Can I get the next slide, please? So um, as part of this talk, uh, I'm going to try and touch upon uh, a bunch of things. I've tried to categorize everything into into these spec in, into these sections here. Uh, I'll start off with indexing and search, move on to stability, scalability, security, then talk about deprecations and removal, uh, which are very important, and then try to talk about everything else that does not fall into these buckets. Uh, but one thing to remember is uh, Solar 9.0 is uh, is a major version release, and to to do justice to a major version release um, um, in 40 minutes is uh, is just not possible. So I'm trying to do my best uh, to cover as many things as I can, but I may have to uh, leave out a few things. So if you have any uh, specific interest, please please look at the change log to understand what actually has happened as part of this release uh, to get a more complete picture of this. Can I get the next slide, please? So indexing and search is always uh, at the very core of Solar, uh, which is kind of obvious. It is a search engine. All you want to do is be, be able to index data and uh, be able to search through it. And so uh, uh, let's start off with the features or the changes in Apache Lucy and Solar that directly impact indexing and search. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to try and reconnect in the meanwhile. OK. Yeah. So um, in the recent past, uh, the industry has kind of seen um, a paradigm shift, especially in certain use cases. And if you attended to some of the talks by Alessandro, by Joe, you would have realized uh, how everyone's trying to talk about uh, neural search. And uh, with the release of Solar 9.0, uh, Solar piggybacks on a feature that was introduced by Lucene and the capabilities of Lucene to allow for being able to search on um, a dense vector field type. Uh, so you can now define a dense vector field type. Uh, if you don't know too much about it, the idea is um, traditionally search worked on very sparse vectors where every every keyword was a dimension in the space. Uh, but this paradigm completely shifts everything into making things more compressed, uh, things more meaningful rather than just being a bag of words. Uh, what Solar allows you to also provides you uh, as a tool here is uh, the query parser that allows you to search on these dense vectors. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting change. I haven't personally tried it yet, but uh, from the conversations I've had, I feel like this is one of the really important changes uh, or features that have come to Solar um, as part of the 9.0 release. 
okay, the clicker worked. Um, next up is the text analysis. And um, the text analysis uh, part ties back into the traditional sense of how search works. Um, and with this release, uh, there's a whole bunch of new Snowball stemmers that have been added, uh, adding better language capabilities for languages like Hindi, Indonesian, Nepali, uh, Serbian, Tamil, and Yiddish, uh, as well as there's a new Norwegian normalization filter that has been added as part of the 9.0 release, only making uh, this, this version of Solar much more richer and capable when it comes to being able to uh, handle languages outside of uh, English or other languages that it supported so far. Uh, So indexing and search, uh, the reason why I put this slide as part of this section is because a lot of people in the recent past have slowly and uh, slowly uh, graduated or moved towards using Solar as not just a traditional text search engine, but for SQL purposes. Uh, and that, that kind of makes sense because at the end of the day, from a search engine, all you're trying to do is be able to store some data and be able to get that data back based on a certain, uh, you know, risk criteria. And SQL kind of try is just a language for being able to specify what is the data that you need. Uh, with Solar 9.0, all of the SQL, much loved SQL capabilities of Solar 9 of earlier Solar versions stay uh, as is. The only change that happens is that SQL is now a module by itself, so it's moved outside of the core. It doesn't impact the core directly. Uh, so uh, the functionality is right there, but it's made uh, things much easier for developers to organize and manage the code base. In addition, uh, while you could in the past, uh, I, people had, uh, users had admin UI support for basic searching and querying capabilities. Uh, with this release, there's, uh, there's support for, uh, for running SQL queries using the admin UI. Stability. Um, as as systems uh, get to be more critical, there's a there's obviously a much more need for things to get to be made and kept uh, stable. You can only use a system if you can rely upon it. So this uh, all the changes that come out with Solar 9.0 in some way impact the stability uh, of the system. You don't want it to go down in the stability levels of a system that once was. And one of the more, one of the really important things is that uh, the developers or maintainers of an open source project or any project in general get to do with uh, with a major version release is dependency upgrades. And while I wouldn't dive into the, into the details of uh, of these dependency upgrades, and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm guessing there are more dependency upgrades that happened as part of this release. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I would like to highlight two things here. Uh, one is that. Uh, the minimum version supported uh, for, by, by Solar for, uh, for Solar 9.0 is JDK 11 up from JDK 8. Um, and the other thing, uh, and I'm going to get back to this uh, a little in a little while, is um, because of the projects being split and establishment of Lis Solar as a top level project, Lucene is now a dependency for Solar. And while it might not mean too much for you, um, I will uh, I'll talk to you in a little bit about how this is an important aspect to consider uh, when you're working with Solar in the future. And okay, uh, rate limiting. So there are times when you want to guarantee uh, the, the capacity for a specific kind of request type. As an example, let's say you want to have 42 select requests uh, be aware, 42 select requests be able to process at any given point in time. And this is a JVM level setting that allows you to specify how many requests of a specific type should be uh, kind of guaranteed, but also can be processed. And what the way it works is when a request comes in, um, Solar takes in the request tries to allocate a slot for that request. If it's unable to allocate a slot for that request, there are two options. One, it can wait, hang on to that request for a little while, um, and that time can be specified by the wait for slot allocation and millisecond parameter. Uh, and the reason why you want to do that is because the other alternate is to put this request into a wait list. Now, of course, putting something into the wait list and getting it back off the wait list is going to incur an overhead. 
Um, and to avoid that overhead, you can specify how long are you willing to wait before even uh, incurring that overhead. Um, in addition, uh, there are some interesting parameters like the allow slot borrowing that allows you to be able to borrow slots from other request types. So when, when you can borrow slots, there's also a chance that you might end up over borrowing from someone uh, from other request type that then runs out of its own slots. So if, to, to guarantee that every slot uh, or every request type has a certain number of slots that it always preserves for its own use, uh, you can you can specify something called the guaranteed slots uh, that guarantees the availability for that request type uh, at that at that level. Uh, one thing to remember is uh, this is an experimental feature. So if there's something that you would want to try, please feel free to, free to try it and report to the community. Uh, send out a mailing, uh, an email to the mail list, uh, ping people there uh, if you have any feedback if, or if you have any questions related to this. So uh, every now and then there have been there have been requests from users who've asked about uh, is there a way we could uh, kill a request to, that we don't want to process or something that's taking too long or something that we don't feel like we need a long running task or long running query and yes uh, there can be queries that can run for a, for an extended duration so there have been requests where people have asked is there a way for us to go back to Solar and say we we fired this query, we want to now cancel this query, and task management allows you to do exactly that and more. What task management interface allows you to do is to be able to list track status of or cancel uh, a request that has been that has been marked as cancelable. Uh, requests can be marked as cancelable when you send these requests um, to Solar. And while this applies to queries right now, uh, this is very easily extendable to all of the other request types. Another important um, thing to note here is while it sounds very similar to the idea of time allowed, it's kind of related but orthogonal at the same time in the sense that it allows you to short circuit a request when it's taking too long, but the task management interface allows you to cancel a request on the basis of much more than just time. For example, if you have a request that came in uh, or if you have two requests that you want to send out and you only want the response from one of those, whatever comes back sooner, as soon as the first request comes back, you can send out a request to cancel the other um, the other uh, long running query. And these queries could be compute intensive, would be taking resources. So that's a good way to get back your resources and save time. Moving on to scalability. Scalability and stability are kind of closely tied. Uh, when you're trying to scale your system, uh, you're obviously trying to look at uh, the stability aspect of it. But at the same time, scalability kind of in isolation looks at what are the, how stable does the system stay when you try to scale it beyond uh, you know, what's regularly accepted. And a new experimental feature that has been introduced in Solar is that of node roles. What node roles allows users to do is uh, to be able to specify a certain role for a specific Solar instance. Um, you can specify these values at startup uh, and, by, and right now out of the box Solar supports two, data, two node roles. One of them is the data node, uh, data role and the other one is the overseer. Uh, there are two possible values for data, which is on and off. There are three possible values for overseer, which is allowed, preferred, and disallowed. If you if you want to add a new node role, uh, you can do so by using one of these two uh, values uh, value sets. I'll give you an example uh, in a four node cluster, uh, on, like the example on uh, diagram on the right. Uh, nodes nodes one and two uh, have been marked as disallowed for overseer. Uh, Node three has been marked as allowed for the overseer, and node four has been marked disallowed for data and preferred for the overseer. When you set up a system like this, what ends up happening is Solar is going to go and try and make node four as your overseer. 
that might be a, a, a use case where all your um, all your instances are actually very IO heavy, trying to compute a lot of things, and you don't want your overseer, which is a central management uh, instance, running on the same uh, Solar instance. So what you end up doing is you, you tell Solar to not host any data on that instance, only treat that as an overseer. It might also be the condition where uh, you have different hardware setups. And so you've set things up differently for your data as well as your overseer uh, instances. And uh, when when the node four goes down for whatever reason in such a case, uh, Solar is gonna go and start looking at the instances for a new overseer election and realize that node one and two cannot be elected as overseers because you've marked this, that as disallowed. Whereas uh, node three can be elected as an overseer, but uh, you could configure your solar in a way where three is not never really heavily loaded. Uh, three is not hosting too much data. So it's running lighter loads, allowing you to run your overseer without too much, you know, too much to worry about. And can I have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, replica placement plugins. Um, this is an uh, this is a substitute for auto scaling. Um, auto scaling is a feature that was introduced a few versions ago and had stayed in Solar. Uh, and I'm going to get to that as listed along the list of things that have been uh, deprecated or removed. Uh, Auto scaling as it existed in previous versions no longer exists in Solar. But replica placement plugins kind of allow users to do most of what um, auto scaling was trying to do or was trying to accomplish. Um, it's an easy to use API and offers a whole bunch of uh, things or a whole bunch of uh, plugin factories uh, that you can use to decide where a new replica would get added. So it doesn't allow you to do any magical things, anything, uh, you know, it doesn't uh, auto scale or do any of, the, any of those things, but it allows you to specify a way in which you want your data to be uh, uh, placed on your solar cluster. So uh, there's a simple, place, uh, simple placement plugin there's a random placement uh, factory. There's minimized score placements factory, which are kind of obvious in terms of what they do. And then there's the affinity placement factory. Uh, affinity placement factory is what you might want to use in your production systems if you're really worried about how your data resides or where your data resides, because it allows you to respect things like availability zone and uh, ensure that data is distributed across, say, racks or availability zones. Moving on, uh, the distributed overseer. Um, I just spoke about node roles and I just mentioned how you can now specify a specific node in Solar to be your, uh, to be your overseer by specifying the node role. Uh, this feature in Solar, also an experimental feature of Solar 9, um, has been worked upon uh, for a reasonably long time. Overseer is a centralized uh, centralized uh, responsible is a responsibility of a node uh, that uh, handles cluster state updates, config API updates, as well as uh, uh, handles uh, the collection API call processing. So it uh, kind of makes sense to not have this uh, be the single point of failure. Of course, Solar is going to go ahead and elect a new overseer if something were to happen to your existing overseer. But in an ideal case, you don't want it to be centralized. And th uh, this is an attempt at distributing the role of the overseer across your cluster so that there's no single point of failure. Um, so it brings in all of, the all of the benefits that a traditional or a regular distributed system will bring to you. But at the same time, it's, it's not the default with 9.0, it's available for people to use. Uh, and it allows for handling and processing of distributed cluster updates as well as collection and config API calls. Uh, you will need to opt for it and you can try running it. If you have any feedback, uh, again, this is one of those things that's experimental and the community would really appreciate any feedback that you might have um, on this. Can I have the next slide, please? 
As a system that holds data, uh, security has, is a critical part of solar, and even more so in the last few years. Uh, a really high amount of effort has been put into making sure that solar, solar gets even more secure than it always has been. And while security patches have been released as, as part of dot releases along the edX line, uh, there have been a few things that were waiting that were not essential, but were really good to have that we waited to be released with 9.0. Um, so let me talk about uh, what those what those features or uh, capabilities are. Can I get the next slide, please? The first one is the certificate authentication plugin. Uh, the certificate authentication plugin uh, in a single line allows you to use client certificates end-to-end uh, -end for both authentication and authorization. Uh, on an implementation level, it supports the loading of the certificate subject via the user principle into the authorization context, allowing you to use the client, certific client certificate in an end-to-end -end and seamless way. Uh, this is a big win for anyone who's using client certificate because it it no longer only does the authentication side of things, but is, is an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, next up is the PKI authentication plugin. Um, late along the 8.11 lines, there was a realization that uh, the, the PKI authentication uh, format, header format. Uh, PK authentication is what Solar uses for uh, all secure internode communication, which is when it's talking to each other, when Solar nodes are talking to each other, PKI authentication is what it uses by default, if you've set it up, if you've enabled security. Um, and it was realized that it wasn't, uh, there were two issues with it. One, it wasn't the most secure way of doing it, or it wasn't secure enough way of doing it. But at the same time, the other important aspect was uh, there were things like the timestamp that were uh, that were inside the encoded value. So if you need a timestamp, which can easily be outside of the encoded value and can be used to do some pre-processing and decide on a few things before putting in the compute resources required for um, for um, moving forward uh, with processing of the request, um, it made sense for these values to stay outside. And that by that value, I, me I mean the timestamp or the user. And uh, with this update, it uh, uh, an important thing that it does is that it changes the encrypting from, from using a public key to signing with a private key. Uh, that makes the entire process way more secure, but in addition, it stores a bunch of things in the header unencrypted, allowing uh, Solar to process these values and dec make decisions or short circuit if needed without having to go through the compute overhead of, uh, of uh, decoding. Uh, values. If you're running older versions of Solar, there are a few migration paths. So please check out the change log or, uh, or the reference guide to see what your options are to make sure that you switch over to the new version the right way. Uh, I believe with 9.0, the Solar Auth V2 is the default uh, is the default uh, header that's going to get used. So please. Uh, please make sure that you've done your bit to uh, to try to correctly upgrade to nine. Up, until Solar 8.x, um, if you enable TLS in Solar, while everything worked uh, worked fine and uh, all of the interaction between a client and Zookeeper, a client and Solar, and between Solar instances themselves was TLS enabled, there was no way for Solar to talk to Zookeeper over TLS, and that wasn't a restriction that Solar had. That was a restriction uh, of the Java clients offered by Zookeeper. Uh, with the ZK 3.7 release, which happened about a year ago, um, the ZK client now allows for these clients to use TLS to communicate with ZK or uh, TLS enabled Zookeeper clusters, uh, allowing people to run an end to end TLS secure uh, solar cluster where not only are solar interactions TLS enabled, but also solar interactions with Zookeeper TLS enabled. So while it's not a critical change, uh, it might not seem like a critical change. It's not something that's been written about too much. It's a very important change for anyone who's running Solar with TLS. 
Other notable changes uh, include uh, enabling of the Jetty request log. Um, the request log now logs to the right, uh, right directory in a correct and compatible format for, for tooling, uh, which is super useful because what it allows you to do is to, it allows you to go back and audit the requests to your solar cluster. Um, solar by default doesn't log most of the requests. For example, for select requests by default, it wouldn't log these requests unless these are slow requests. And so you're going to miss out on all, a lot of access information. So in case of a security breach, you may never know what actually happened. With the enabling of Jetty request log in 9.0, um, it only means that you will have that information by default. One thing to remember though, is yes, it will add overhead to the amount of logs that you're collecting. So if this is something, if you're worried about security, if you want to keep it secure, please leave it enabled. If there are reasons that don't allow you to keep your request logging enabled, uh, you might want to go back and disable it. I, I don't recommend doing that, but that's an option. Another thing that's happened is in the past, if you wanted to change the log, uh, actually, uh, sorry, uh, all request handlers now support security permissions for access. So while the permissions name provider interface was something that was available for all the handlers to, to extend, uh, it wasn't the case for everything that was shipped with Solar. With 9.0, um, all, all handlers that are shipped with Solar right now um, allow for setting of security permissions, and there's no handler that doesn't allow for users to do that. Um, a lot of users in the community have uh, had in the past asked about ways to disable admin UI uh, and 9.0 allows users to uh, disable the admin UI via system property. A lot of times people want to do this for security aspect, not wanting to give access or avoiding accidental uh, updates to their solar cluster. And so the disabling of the admin UI via system property is super useful thing for people who only want their solar interactions to happen through their client apps, for example. Moving on to the build uh, side, um, it's an important, the build changes are really important for developers. It might be less important for users, but uh, overall, it's, it's also very critical for anyone who's running internal builds. If you're someone who's, who takes solar, uh, gets the code base, tries to build stuff and tries to add your own things to it, or you have uh, something that you do a little differently, you want to be, you, you should be concerned about the changes uh, in the right way uh, about the changes that have been introduced with Solar 9.0. Uh, So uh, Lucene and Solar, as I already mentioned, are now separated. And an important thing to remember there uh, is that Solar only has Lucene as a dependency at this point. What that means is if you're running, say, a Solar plugin that relies on some Lucene capability, um, while right now with Solar 9, it doesn't matter because both of them were released with the same version. So if you're looking at Solar 9, it uses Lucene 9, which kind of makes sense. But in the future, you, there might be a point because these are now independent projects where a version of Solar does not match up exactly with a version of Lucene for reasons that the community chose. Um, and when that happens, if you're trying to build things uh, that rely on both Lucene and Solar, please make sure that you're, uh, you're respecting what Solar relies on and depends on while, um, while trying to use those Lucene capabilities. An important change, uh, and while uh, there's not a lot going on on this on this slide, um, I'm going to say it is one of those changes that took the most amount of time when it came to the 9.0 release. Uh, it took a village uh, to sum it up, to, to get the Gradle stuff, uh, to everything uh, to move from Ant to Gradle. Uh, Solar uh, is an old project. It relied on Ant for a very long time, and things were complex until uh, some, someone from the community tried to add a new module, realized how complicated editing the build.xml was, how painful it was, and the person involved uh, was a committer, uh, realized that if, if it was that difficult for that person, 
it certainly would be even worse for anyone who's not been associated with the project for long enough or does not uh, has not dived into the project lot as much. Um, a conversation was started to move to a more modern build system, which was Gradle. Um, and everyone got together into moving stuff, almost everything uh, to Gradle. It took almost two years, I guess, longer than that to move everything to Cradle. But right now, uh, Solar is not completely migrated to Cradle. So if you're using um, Solar 9.0 or Lucy 9.0, everything um, is built and released using Cradle. And Cradle brings in a whole bunch of capabilities. One, it's a much more modern system that addresses the challenges that Ant, uh, Ant uh, had. In addition, the capability of caching results in, uh, in Gradle uh, make make it, make running of tasks much faster. As an example, uh, rerunning the forbidden APIs uh, API call went down from one minute to about five seconds. Um, and the incremental builds are super useful with Gradle in terms of saving developer time. Um, there's also native support in the IDEs uh, and adding dependencies uh, and handling dependencies it is much more easier and manageable when you're doing so with Gradle as compared to Ant. So you don't need to run Ant Clean, Clean Idea, and a whole bunch of other stuff when you're trying to change dependencies or do something with those. Uh, Docker, uh, the Solar Docker uh, Stuff was donated by some in the community to the PMC uh, a while ago, but ever since was managed outside of the, the, the Apache Solar GitHub repository by a few people. With 9.0, all of that was brought under the umbrella the right way, uh, um, under the umbrella of the Apache PMC. So now the image, image creation bit is part of the Apache Solar GitHub repository. Um, the, the documentation for Docker is part of the reference guide. Uh, the official image has been upgraded, uh, upgraded to JDK 17 by Eclipse Terrain instead of JDK 11. And that's, uh, some people might question why so, because Solar's minimum requirement is JDK 11, but the Docker image, official Docker image is being shipped with JDK 17. And the reason for that is um, we, uh, we didn't want to wait until the next major release for, uh, for switching over to the JDK version. Um, with the cadence of release for J for Java uh, being much higher now than in the past, it only made sense to already hop into a more recent JDK release instead of relying on JDK 11. Uh, and the Docker image is completely customizable, but at the same time, it allows uh, developers to create a functionally identical local image, just like the official Docker image. Uh, when I what I mean by official Docker image is in terms of the mount points and the data directory and everything else around, associated around it. That brings me to deprecations and removal. A rather important aspect, especially because it's a major version release, allows the developer community or the maintainers, uh, the PMC, to remove a whole bunch of things that uh, users may still want. Uh, so the first thing is the data import handler. It was uh, it's something that wasn't really well supported uh, um, over the years, uh, but there were still users. So while um, instead of just deleting and removing it and dropping all of that from the code base, uh, it was transferred over to a third party. It's not in a part of Apache code base anymore. So just remember when you're using it, when you find it on the internet, Please remember that it's not offered by the Apache Solar PMC at this point. It's something that's offered by someone else outside of the Apache umbrella. Uh, so if you run into any issues, if there are any security concerns, uh, you need to work with those people who own the, the project at this point. Uh, the Solar PMC is not going to have any say in the project at, at, this, at this point. Legacy cloud support. If um, if this is uh, not something that you know or understand, you can totally skip this slide. Uh, but for people who still use legacy cloud uh, coming from the 4x, 5x line, um, it did default to false in 7. It allowed for automatic core creation because it didn't assume that Zookeeper was truth, uh, which is how Solar Cloud worked in the past. So. 
with with legacy cloud uh, support gone, Zookeeper is assumed to be the truth. So if if you have core sitting on your data directory, or si- sitting in your solar directory, um, when solar comes up, and if there's no mention of these cores in Zookeeper, solar is not going to respect that. So if you rely as a hack or something else, uh, I know there are some certain peculiar use cases in 8x especially that kind of forced you to switch on legacy cloud to do some things. If you still rely on that, please remember that legacy cloud support is completely gone. There's no more auto-loading, of course. A zookeeper is going to be the, the source of truth at this point of time. Uh, other changes, the, the state format, uh, which was changed, and I think with the, along the 5X lines uh, and had been sitting there, uh, the old state format is no longer supported. The API that allowed people or users to migrate from the old state to the new state format has also been removed. So if you have any collections that were created using old solar, solar versions, please make sure um, please make sure that you have uh, migrated the state format to a newer version. Uh, as part of the 8x, uh, as part of the 8x release, so get onto the 8x line, use the migrate state format API. Once you're done with the migrate state format API call, then move on to nine. If you move on to nine, these collections will not be usable. Uh, another thing to note is that the legacy BM25 similarity factory has been removed. Uh, so if you use that, please go through the reference guide and see what that means for you. What can you do, and what your options are. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, I think I might have lost people. I'm not sure if I'm still in the call. Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've been pros. I just refreshed everything, so I, I wasn't sure if things were still on. Um, moving on to HDFS support, uh, everything has now moved on to uh, a module, so that doesn't really me- have any impact on users. Everything stays uh, as is. It's just moved outside of Solar Core. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I think, uh, yeah. I think we missed a few slides. We are. So you were all supposed to be yes. to finish uh, say, in one here. minute, but uh, if you have something yeah, else I, to say, we need to take the question after this. Yeah. Uh, so the auto scaling framework uh, has been replicated. I already spoke about the replica placement plugin um, that takes over the auto scaling framework. Please try using that. But if you're running Solar on Kubernetes, uh, one of my colleague and Solar PMC members, Houston Putman, who drives the Solar Operator effort is at the conference, please meet him, please see him uh, if you want to learn about Solar Operator. I'm going to try and wrap this up uh, quickly. Running out of time. Uh, Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, the CDCR support has been removed from Solar, but there's a new uh, SIP in the works. Uh, Check out the Solar Sandbox repository. Feel free to contribute. Uh, it's been actively worked on at this point. So if a cross data center replication is something you're interested in, uh, please uh, please pitch in, contribute in whatever way you can. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, everything else and the next slide, please. Uh, HDFS support uh, has also moved to a module. Um, doesn't take away any of the capabilities of what HDFS supported. Um, 
are, are what Solar supported from HDFS, but um, it's just moved outside of a module for better management of the code base. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there have been some more logging changes, improved tracing, and uh, the handler is now distributed, which is optional. You don't need to go to every solar instance to switch over uh, to uh, switch over the log level. Uh, for a specific thing, you can now distribute this change across your solar cluster. And MDC prefix labels are no longer hard-coded. So if you use prefix labels, please remember to set them in your solar config. Uh, they wouldn't be auto-set uh, with, with Solar 9. Can we move to the next slide, please? I might need a minute here. Uh, the metrics, uh, the Prometheus exporter has seen some improvements. Uh, the class path for which has already been pre-added to Docker, making it super easy to run. Uh, the, the dependencies have been improved, so it now only depends on solar chain instead of relying on solar server. Uh, as well as the separation of metrics for certain top-level requests allow you to view what's a top-level request as compared to internal requests, allowing you to also segregate these request types and see what's actually going on in your solar cluster. Can we move to the next slide? Uh, and the next one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, Solar 9 offered a whole bunch of uh, benefits. Uh, it took a lot of time, it took a lot of effort, and it made the, the build system much better. It improved performance and it makes Solar much more secure. Um, what I spoke about today is just a tip of the iceberg, uh, but there's a lot more around uh, what was released with Solar 9.0. If, you, if you're interested in learning more, please go through the change log and the reference guide uh, there's a whole bunch of things that came out with solar that the 40 minutes wouldn't have allowed me to speak about. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for uh, being a part of this talk, uh, being here with me, uh, and thank you very much. Uh, do you do we have some question for Anshu? Okay, so I think uh, we can leave you. Uh, thanks for this presentation and uh, have a nice day. Thank you.